Good morning and welcome to First Colony. So glad all of you are here. What a joy it is to gather in this place and worship Jesus together. Amen. Man, I just want to thank Richard and thank our worship team. Don't they do a great job in just leading us every week in worship? Awesome. Just to come together into the presence of the living God and to sing those words, hallelujah, praise God, because you have done great things. Well, welcome. I'm so glad all of you are here. It's all those of you who are watching online. Thank you for joining us for Church Online today as well. Today we are, we're bringing this series to an end, this series, short little series we've called If we believe, and if you haven't been here for a couple of weeks, if you've missed it, I'll catch you up real quick. The the big idea behind this series is really this simple thought. I think it's significant, but, but it is simple. That if we believe what we say we believe about Jesus, it absolutely changes everything for us. And I want you to think about that one more time today. When we started this series a couple of weeks ago, we wanted to begin with the end in mind. And now that we're at the end of this series, I want us to end at the beginning with a question that really comes at the beginning, a question that comes at the very beginning of faith for all of us. It's a question that that truthfully everyone has to answer. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter where you live, what language you speak. It doesn't matter what your title or position or what you've achieved or maybe what you haven't achieved. Like, truthfully, none of that even really matters. It's a question that everybody has to answer, a question that everybody will answer at some point in their life. And we'll get to that question in just a moment. But before we do, I want to ask you this question. Like, what's the most important question, think about this, what's the most important question you've ever had to answer? The other day I had to answer a really important question. I'd only been here a couple of days, you know, getting my feet on the ground. Uh, Our friend Joel Smith, he's our children's minister. If you haven't met Joel, you need to meet Joel, great guy. He invites me to lunch. I'm like, absolutely, where you want to go? I don't care, you name the place. He's like, okay, let's go get tacos. I'm like, fantastic. Any restaurant with the word taco in it, I'm in. And I know as soon as I walk in the door, I'm going to have to answer the most important question I've had to answer all week. What kind of taco do you want? (laughs) Well, I get there, and you know what this is like. Uh, There's a menu, and it's full, and there's, you know, hundreds of kinds of tacos, and I don't want to make a bad decision. This is a very important question. Somebody say amen. Uh, This is a big deal. And I'm looking at the menu, and I know the guy behind the counter is going to ask me, what kind of taco do you want? And I don't know the answer. Joel says, you want the bang, bang shrimp taco. It'll change your life. I'm like, all right. The guy asked me, what kind of taco do you want? I want the bang, bang shrimp taco. I've heard it'll change my life. And you know what? I think it did. Um, (laughs) You know what this is like. How we answer, I mean, here's the idea. How we answer the, the questions we answer in one way or another, to one degree or another, they will determine the direction of our lives. The course of your life is going to be affected and even changed. The trajectory of your life will be altered depending on how you answer the questions that you answer. And we all know what it's like to face these kinds of life-changing, life-altering questions. Not every question is life-changing or life-altering, at least not in a major significant way. And I've certainly had to answer more significant questions in the last few days uh, other than what kind of taco do you want? (laughs) But we know what this is like. There are certain questions that come your way, that come my way, and depending on how we answer those questions, they have the potential to change everything for us. And you know what these questions are like. Questions like, where do you want to go to college? What do you want to study? What do you want to major in? What are you going to do with your life? Questions like, will you marry me? Can I have your daughter's hand in marriage? Questions like, do you want to have kids? What if we can't have kids? How can we have kids? Questions like, how are we going to make ends meet? What are we going to do now that you're sick? What do we do now that we're at this point in our lives? Questions like, what are we going to do about this relationship? 
How are we going to make this work? Can we make this work? Questions like, do you want the job? Do you want the car? Do you want the house? Questions like, do you want the bang bang shrimp taco? And the answer is yes, you do. There are certain questions in your life that depending on how you answer those questions, they have the power, the potential to change the trajectory of your life. And we all know what this is like. But the truth is we don't all have to answer the same set of questions. The questions you have to face, the questions I have to answer, there may be a different set of questions that we have to deal with throughout the course of our lives. But we all know what it's like to face these different kinds of questions. But there is one question we all have in common. There's one question that we all have to give an answer to, and we all will give an answer to, and how everything hangs in the balance of how we answer this question. But I want you to know this isn't a question I came up with. It's not original to me. This question wasn't developed in some think tank somewhere. This, This question has been around for a long time. There are people who, because of how they decided to answer this question, at different points in history and even in the world today, because of of the choices they've made and how they answer this one particular question, they've had to suffer. Some people, if you can imagine this, have even given their life because of how they decided to answer this question. It's a question that, well, Jesus was the first one to ever ask it. And today what I want to do in just a few minutes is just share with you this one story and share with you this one question I want to share with you how one of his earliest friends and followers answered it. And I want to ask you today just how you would answer this question. Because I think this question has the power to change everything for you. If you have your Bible, if you have a Bible app you'd like to use, I'd invite you this morning to open to Luke chapter 9. We've been working through the gospel of Luke throughout this series. Luke, again, was a doctor, a missionary. He took it upon himself to talk to as many eyewitnesses as he could People who saw what Jesus did, heard what Jesus said. He wrote down this collection of stories into this this one account, this one gospel account, so that people that came later, people like you and me, could read his story, this story of Jesus of Nazareth, and come to faith, come to believe. And when we get to Luke chapter 9, we're at this really interesting moment in the story. Jesus has just sent out his disciples on their very first mission trip. And and watch this. He gave them the power to heal the sick and cast out demons. Can you imagine imagine the stories they had when they got home from that mission trip? They had to be unbelievable. They get back and now they're with Jesus. And now Jesus has has got all these people who have gathered around him. Some say 5,000, but it was probably more like 10,000, 15,000 if you count women and children. People are hungry after a long day of listening to Jesus teach. They don't know where to get food. They find a boy who's got, you know, five pieces of bread, two fish. The disciples of Jesus now get to participate in a miracle of Jesus because Jesus prays for this this lunchbox. And then they go out and they start handing out food and they just never run out. There's enough for everybody. And as the disciples are doing this, just like what happened in the mission field, they're hearing stories. They're hearing people talk about Jesus. Jesus. And Jesus has now gathered his disciples with him. He spent all this time ministering, helping people, teaching people, loving people, healing people. But now Luke writes in chapter 9, verse 18, that now, on this day, one day, Jesus left the crowds. Why? Because he wanted to pray alone. Only his disciples were with him. At this point in the story, after all the ministry, all the teaching, all the preaching, all the, he had told people what the kingdom of God is like, and he spent all this time showing them, loving them, helping them, healing them, feeding them. And now Jesus wants to teach his disciples another significant truth, a spiritual practice, really, that, that, and this was true for Jesus. So just imagine how true this must be for his disciples. That, that if Jesus wanted to show people the Father, there would come time when he would need to withdraw so he could spend time with the Father. And he wanted his disciples then, just like he wants you to know now, that, 
that if you want to show people the Father, then you need to spend time with the Father. And after all the ministry he's done with people, now he has to leave the people so we can spend time alone in prayer. And he gathers his closest disciples around him. And after praying together, he wants to ask them a question. And this isn't the question, by the way. This is the question before the question. But listen to what Luke says happens next. Only his disciples were with him. And Jesus asked them, who do people say I am? Now, again, this isn't the question. This is the question before the question. What Jesus wants to know is, is you guys, you've, you've been with the people. You were just there handing out the, the bread and the fish and, and, and participating in this miracle of abundance, this miracle of provision. And I know you're hearing what people are saying. And I just want to know, I'm curious, who, who do people say I am? You've seen me and they've seen me heal the sick. You've seen me and they've seen me teach people about what the kingdom of God is like. You've seen me care for the suffering and the brokenhearted. And, and you've seen me welcome children into, into my presence. You've seen me sit at the table with both sinners and self-proclaimed saints. Who do, who do people say I am? What are they saying about me? And Jesus really wants to know. Because everybody who was anybody who was anybody, they all understood. They all had this preconceived idea that when God's Messiah came, they thought they knew what was going to happen. They had different opinions about it. Some people thought that when God's Messiah came, he would set them free from their Roman oppressors. And many people wanted someone like a king, like King David, a political leader to come, to lead a revolution, to overthrow the Romans, to sit again on the throne and restore the kingdom of Israel. Some people wanted a prophet a great and mighty prophet like those prophets who had come before to call the people of God back to God. Some people were hoping for a priest, a great priest, like the priest who had come before, someone who could usher the people of God back into the presence of God. But you know, like I know, that Jesus, what Jesus was about to do, it wasn't going to be anything like anyone expected. Right here in Luke 9, this story, Luke's story takes a turn, and Luke does this on purpose. But right here in this chapter, Jesus and his disciples are about to begin a journey toward Jerusalem. And what waits Jesus in a Jerusalem is not a throne. He's not ready to lead a revolution, at least not the kind that many people were expecting. What awaits Jesus in Jerusalem is a cross. So Jesus wants to know. All these people have all these ideas and expectations. But you're my closest disciples. Who do people say I am? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah. Others say you're one of the other ancient prophets risen from the dead. That's who people say you are. But now Jesus dials it in. And he asks them this question, and it's the most important question he'll ever ask them. And by the way, it's the most important question he'll ever ask you. Jesus asked them, but who do you say I am? And you may have been here for 20 minutes, or you may have been here for 20 years. You may be watching for the first time online today, or you may have been watching for months and months. You may, you, you, you may have been a follower of Jesus your entire life, or you may be here today and you're not sure what you think about when you think about God. But don't miss this. Every single person has to answer this singular question. Who do you say I am? Who is Jesus? This is the question it's at the very beginning of belief. And before Jesus takes this journey with these disciples to Jerusalem, he wants them to ask and answer this one question, who do you say I am? There's a sense in which this is a question you probably ask and answer every single day. 
Uh, many of you know, most of you know, I'm brand new here. Our family's brand new here. So I'm meeting a lot of you for the very first time. I'm meeting a lot of people in our community for the very first time. And this is always the very first question you get asked, right? Who do you, it's not who do you say I am. It's just, you know, what's your name? Who are you? And I never mind telling you my name. I never mind swapping names and, and getting to meet each other and getting to know each other a little bit. I never, I never mind somebody saying, hey, what's your name? It's the next question that gives me pause. Because you know the next question. The first question is, hey, what's your name? What's the second question? The second question is always something like, well, what do you do? And as soon as I answer that question, it, it kills the conversation. I'll never forget. <laughs> you know. I'll never forget, my kids were small, you know, Will's playing baseball, some t-ball team or something somewhere, and he's out in the field with all of his buddies, all the dads are out by the dugout, and we're talking, we're laughing, there may have been some colorful language being used, and I'm just listening and, and, and in trying to participate where I can, and after 15, 20 minutes of storytelling and all the fun things that happen out there on the ball field, one of the dads starts, starts asking the question, well, tell me your name, who are you, and who are you, and so we start meeting each other and I know it's coming. I know I'm in trouble because then the very next thing is, well, what do you do? What do you do? And then it's my turn. And now I've got a decision to make, you know? I could say I'm a public speaker. <laughs> I might get away with that. I, I could say, you know, I, I'm a leader in a nonprofit organization in our community that helps people. That's, that might work. But as soon as I say I'm a preacher, everything changes, and it gets really awkward really fast. It just changes things. But you know, like I know, the most important question you have to answer, it's, it's not about you. The most important question you have to answer is who is God? If you rewind the story some 1,500 years before Jesus, there's another moment that's similar, but just a little bit different. You may know this story. A man by the, Moses, uh, by the name of Moses meets God at a, at a burning bush. Famous story. God is calling Moses, inviting Moses to go into Egypt where the people of God, Israel, living in slavery and captivity for hundreds of years, and to bring them out of that slavery, out of that darkness, out of that bondage, into freedom, into light, into the promised land of God. But Moses is not so sure he's the man for the job. And Moses asks God, he's like, if, 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 if I go, like, first of all, who am I that I should go and stand before Pharaoh in Egypt, the most powerful person on the planet? Exodus 3, God looks at Moses and he says, don't worry about who you are. All you need to know is this, I am with you. Moses still isn't sure he's the man for the job. And so he says, well, God, if, let's, just, let's just say I do this and I get there and I, and, I, and I talk to Pharaoh. And then he asks me, what's the name of your God? Who is it that's sending you to me? What do I say? And God says this, you tell him, this is my name. My name is I am, and I am has sent me to you. This is my name, Moses, I am. I am the great I am. There is no one like me. There is no one beside me. I have no rival. I have no equal. I don't care how great you think Pharaoh is. There is no one like me. My name is I am. And by the way, Moses, whatever you need, I am. Whatever you lack, I am. Whatever you desire, I am. My name is I am, and I am is with you. You have nothing to fear. You have nothing to be afraid of. This is my name. I am who I am, and I am is with you. So get up out of this bush and go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. 1,500 years later, the script is flipped. Now Jesus is sitting with a group of men, and they don't quite have it figured out yet, but they're about to be invited to lead people out of darkness and into light, out of slavery and bondage and into freedom and into the abundant life. 
And Jesus is asking them. He's flipped the script. He says, who do you say I am? You need to know who I am. And what's interesting about this moment is that Jesus has already answered the question for his disciples. If you still have your Bible open, just flip back a few pages to Luke chapter 4. There's this incredible moment at the very beginning of the ministry of Jesus. He's back in Nazareth, his hometown, the place he grew up. He's come there for the weekend to worship with friends and family. He's in the synagogue. And one of the attendants comes over to Jesus. You can see the pride on his face. He's home. Jesus, would you read the scripture for us today? He hands him the scroll of Isaiah. And Jesus opens the scroll and he begins to read this passage. Something Isaiah wrote some 700 years before Jesus set foot on planet earth. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed, what? Will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. And then Jesus looks at the crowd and he says, The scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. This is how Jesus begins his ministry. He tells people exactly who he is. Who am I? I am the one you have been waiting on. I am the great I am. And I am here with you. And what does it look like when I am is with us? I'll just keep reading the story. What does Luke tell us? It's amazing to see what happens next because Jesus comes to a man who's been possessed by a demon and he casts that demon out. He sets this man free. He heals a woman who has a fever. He preaches the good news to the poor. He calls people to follow him. He cures a man of the incurable disease of leprosy. He forgives sins. He finds a paralyzed man. He tells him to get up and walk. And what does he do? He does. He teaches people to love their enemies and to build their lives on the solid foundation that is faith in God. He raises a dead man back to life. He calms a raging storm. What does Jesus do? He shows people this is what life looks like when the kingdom of God is near. This is what life looks like when I am is with you. There's never been anyone like him and there is no one beside him. Jesus is the great I am. And now he's seated with his disciples and he asks him this question. And it's the same question you have to ask and answer. Who do you say I am? And Peter, full of faith, responds to the most important question of his life with this answer. Peter replied, you you are the Messiah. You are the anointed one Isaiah prophesied about. You are God's Messiah. You are sent from God. Who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? You are I am. You are the I am that met with Moses. You are the I am that Isaiah prophesied about. You are Jesus. You are the great I am. And here's the good news today, church. Peter's confession, you are the Messiah sent from God. Peter's realization, I am, is with us. That was good news for Peter. That was good news for the disciples of Jesus then. And that is good news for the disciples of Jesus today. Because here's what I want you to know, church. Jesus is the great I am, and I am is with you. And I don't know what you're worried about today. My guess is you've got a million and one things on your heart and mind. But I want you to know Jesus is not worried. I don't know what you're afraid of. And I get it. There are a lot of things to be afraid of in this world. But I want you to know Jesus is not afraid. I don't know 
what you're up against right now. And some of you are up against some hard and heavy things today, and you're not sure how you're going to get through it. But can I remind you of the good news of the great love of God today? If I am is with you, and he is, then on the other side of whatever it is that you're up against right now is resurrection. Because I am is with you. You don't have to fear, and you don't have to be afraid, because this is what we believe. We believe Jesus is, I am, and I am is with you. Church, if you would, let's stand. I want to pray for you this morning. But before I do, I just want to encourage you to think about this. Because we live in a world where people are asking a lot of different questions. But there's one question that rises above the rest. And everything hangs in the balance of how you answer this question. Who is Jesus? And as we end this series today, we want to end with this question that truly is at the beginning of faith. In fact, if you would, just close your eyes with me and imagine this moment. Because we believe Jesus is here among us. And just imagine Jesus asking you this question, looking you right in the eye, square in the eye. And he asks you, who do you say I am? Some of you you haven't come to a point in your life where you've answered that question yet. And listen, that can be for a lot of reasons, but I want to ask you today, are you ready to give an answer? I don't know what's been holding you back. I don't know what obstacles been in your way, but are you ready today to answer that question and to say, yes, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And if so, I want you to know we would love to help you take your next step of faith, whatever that is for you. We would love nothing more than to see you baptized into the name of Jesus, having your sins washed away, being resurrected to new life in the Spirit of God. For a lot of us, though, we hear Jesus ask that question, and we've already given an answer, but let's be honest. More often than not, we live like we haven't. More often than not, we forget. We forget what we believe. We forget that we believe that Jesus is I am and that Jesus is with us. And, and you look at the evidence of our lives and people aren't sure what we believe. We're not sure what we believe. And Jesus is asking you, who do you say I am? And if you believe that he is the Christ, the son of the living God, he is the great I am and I am is with you, I want to call you back into deeper faith and hope and love and remembering that Jesus is with you, Jesus is for you, and nothing can come against you. Those first disciples, they believed so deeply that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that it changed absolutely everything forever. And today I just wonder what will change because we believe. God, this is our prayer. We want to be people of faith. We want to have faith like Peter in this moment to say, yes, Lord, we believe in you. You are Jesus. You are the Messiah. You are sent from God. And some days we have that faith, God, and other days that faith is fading. And we pray that you would remind us of who you are and remind us that you are good, remind us of your grace, and remind us that you are with us and you are for us. Father, thank you. Thank you for sending Jesus who came, who lived, who loved, who died, who rose again, and who has ascended and who is seated at your right hand. Thank you for Jesus, our Savior, our King. 
Thank you. We pray in Jesus' name.